Anybody going back straight to the ground from here? Yeah. It's three o'clock. Who said yeah? Okay. Can I give you something to do, Mrs. Rowe? Anything for you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Okay, let's see who is here. Talia in here. Sarah is here. Bina is not circa. Malka is here. Ariel is here. Michal is here. <laughs> Joseph is here. You good? <laughs> Sir Abigail. She's not here. She's playing. Sir, where she's what? She's playing a gig with the stop my Okay. Tova. Is the Yeshiva vacation going to come here to muck on? <coughs> They're across the street. They have a big street separating the two. Uh, big all, right. all right. So I can't have a street. Anyway, race. how many more days do you have? Rabbi, you give me just a moment. <laughs> two months, 25 days. If you want to take another week or two off. How, how many hours? <laughs> Um, 31 minutes, nine hours, 31 minutes, and 33 seconds. <laughs> I'm up to negotiations. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're on page 20. <clears throat> so this is a continuation of yesterday's lesson about silence which is really about the importance of speech. Silence, as we said yesterday, that speech could be very powerful. Either way, in the positive or the negative. <clears throat> so one of the things that are the most powerful, yes? She doesn't have the book. You don't have, um, I don't have any more copies. No, there aren't any more copies. Could you, could you remind me, okay, but tomorrow, at 10 o'clock when there's a break. If you don't mind to come downstairs, I'll tell the secretary to make more copies. Okay. So one of the things that's in the Torah that emphasizes the importance of speech is actually the laws pertaining to Lush and Hara, which means gossip. And <clears throat> There's a lot of details to this. In fact, there was a book that was written in the previous generation by, uh, what? Guard your tongue, right? That's the book. Written by a very famous author whose name was the Chofetz Chaim. And he wrote this book called it Guard Your Tongue. Those words come from the Tehillim, which says, Nitzorah Deshon Chamerah, guard your tongue from speaking negatively. And <clears throat> he wrote a book with all the laws and all the details that pertain to this. So in this class, we're just going to talk about it in a general way. But generally speaking, it means when people talk about another person and they talk about negative things about the other person, that's called Lashon Hara. And on one hand, it's only speech. I'm not doing anything. I'm only talking. 
but it's, a, it's something very severe in Torah. So I think the first quote on the page, number one, brings out how, how urgent and how important it is to be careful with this. It says, Bashan Hara is equivalent to idolatry, adultery, and murder. In Gemara and Halacha and Medrash, these three things go together. The reason why they go together is because in every other area of Torah, there's a mitzvah. Just for a second. <clears throat> There's every area in Torah, there's a mitzvah that you're supposed to protect your health. What happens if there's something according to Torah that you're supposed to do or not supposed to do? And if you follow the Torah, you're going to be um, risking your life. You're going to be risking your life. So, for example, someone is very sick. And the doctor says the only food that they can eat that's going to help them is something which is not kosher. Are you allowed to eat the not kosher food under those circumstances? And the answer is not only you're allowed to eat, you have to eat because you have to protect your health. So someone's not feeling well on Shabbos. Are you allowed to call the doctor? Are you allowed to take a car to go to a doctor, to a hospital? to save a person's life, not even a question. And it's not always that you know for sure that it's life and death matter, but if there is something going on with a person's health that could even be a doubt of its life and death, you desecrate Shabbos, you save their lives. And that's the same thing with Yontav, Rosh Hashanah, Pesach, Shavuos, all these halachas, when it comes to, God forbid, uh, a person's life is in danger, you violate whatever the halach is and you save the person's life. And the three except, exceptions of these three things. Avodah Zorah, where a person is supposed to give up his life, not to worship idols. Angila Arayas, committing adultery. And the third thing is murder. That a person can say, someone says, if you don't murder him, I'll murder you. No one should ever be in those circumstances. But you're not allowed to protect your own life by murdering someone else. Unless that person is attacking you, of course. That's different. So one of the reasons why Lush and Hara should be equivalent to all three is because Lush and Hara could lead to all three. In other words, when you talk badly about another person, you have no idea what this can lead to, the ripple effects that someone walks away and gets angry and, and who knows what might happen as a result that could lead to any of these three. And therefore, it's considered a very serious violation of Torah. And there's a portion in the Torah called Metzorah. Everyone knows what that is, Metzorah? Mm -hmm. Laws of leprosy, which apply it in the times only in the Beis HaMikdash. But basically it says this was a punishment for speaking Lush and Harva, speaking negatively about another person. So first let me show you here number four. That's, that's the reason why he named his book um, guard your tongue. Here's the Pasuk, it's in Tilim. Mi isha chofetz chayim, who's a man that wants life, and there's a person that wants life, he wants to see good days, what should he do? Guard your tongue from bad, from speaking bad things. What, what tefillin is that? What chapter? Uh, if you give me the Siddur for a second, because it's also in the Siddur, and we say it on Shabbos. I have it at home. Um, yeah, probably easier to find it here. Okay. It's chapter 33, I guess. Chapter 33. Which Pusik? No, just chapter 33. You'll find it there. There's no numbers here to the verses, but it's there right in the middle. No? Yeah, it is, yeah. Mi Yashechov Etzchayim. Yeah. 
Now, the question is like this. What if the thing I'm talking about is actually true? I'm talking about something someone did, but it's true. Is that still considered Lush and Hara? The answer is yes. What if it's not true? So what is it? Lush and Tov? No. I make up a story about somebody. <laughs> so on the sheet, number six is the answer. Oh. It's called Moitzi Shemra, creating a bad name for another person. That means when you make, say a lie about someone, it never happened, and you're trying to, by saying that, you're trying to give the person a bad name. It's the same idea, but it's a little bit different. The difference is, Lashnar is when you're telling the truth, and Moitzi Shemra is when you're lying. What's... The, then there's a fifth, number five is another category, number three, five, rechilus, slander. So slander, I mean, I don't think it's the right word because in English, I think slander also means to give a person a bad name. But really, according to Torah, rechilus comes from the root of a word which means a peddler. These are people that are peddling information from one person to the next. Like, you know what I saw? I saw these two people talking yesterday very quietly. Sabah Shalhara, he didn't say anything bad, but you're talking to one person about what another person did. And again, you don't know what the consequence of that could be. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So I remember, you know, when one of the students told me they came home to their parents, they told them about Lashon Hara, and the parents said, so what could you talk about? It's almost like, if I can't talk about other people, then what can I talk about? Talk about things, you talk about ideas, thought, you have to talk about other people. I thought Lashon Hara is like anything that like would hurt other people. Isn't that just like if you're talking about other people talking? Like, That's exactly what I said. But that Lashon Hara is a general term, but specifically that would be called Rafilus. But that could also be true? It could be true, and you're not saying anything negative. I'm mean, just saying, I saw these two people going on a train together yesterday. Now, in your mind, it means nothing, but you have no idea, maybe that person, will, ah, they're going together, and I know what they're up to, and this could evolve and develop into who knows what. And because we don't know, so the best thing is just don't waste your time talking about other people. Oh. Yeah. Oh. If I even don't say something bad about the person, or just I'm speaking for Sofa, for example, and Simcha is some, somewhere there, so she could probably think that they can speak about her. It's also like the Shinora. That would be the same thing, right? In fact, let me see if I have it here on the page. I don't have it here, but there's something in Halacha. Oh, it is number three. Let's look at number three. It's similar to what you said. A little bit different, but similar. Gimel Averis, there are three Averis that people can hardly prevent from happening. It happens to everybody, every day. What are the three things? Thoughts of Avera, uh, concentrating and davening, and the third thing is dust of Lush and Hara. Let me explain all three. First of all, what does it mean thoughts of Avera? Not everybody has thoughts of Avera. The Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, <clears throat> that a Bainini doesn't do anything wrong, not in speech, not in action, not even in thought. So how could you say that every day, every person, so you learn in Tanya, there's two things when you talk about thought. One is when a thought comes to my mind. A thought comes to my mind. I'm not in control. It just comes from my subconscious and comes up to my conscience, says, hi, hello. And, and, and a thought enters. The difference between the Bainani and an ordinary person is an ordinary person starts thinking about it, continues to think. The Bainani knows how to put on the brakes immediately and, and just stops thinking, doesn't allow himself to think willingly. But the thoughts that come up involuntarily, they just come up from the subconscious, those thoughts I'm not in control. And that's what it means when he says negative thoughts. Every person is human. And being that you heard this, you saw this, you read this, certain thoughts will come up and I have to stop myself from going there. The second thing is, 
concentration in davening. I'm sure everyone tries to concentrate every word in davening, but we get lost in the middle. <laughs> we get lost. Our thoughts wander, and we have to pull it back to get back to the sitter. The third thing is Avik Lashon Hara. So Avik Lashon Hara, I think, would be something similar to what you said. It's not outright Lashon Hara, but it has the same idea as Lashon Hara, like you just said. I'm talking to someone, and I know that the other third person is going to think we're talking about her. Or the example in Gemara is like this. When you're standing with a group of people, and you know that there's someone in the group that doesn't get along with the third person. And you say, oh, this person, she did something wonderful today. She did this and this. What do you think the reaction is going to be? She's going to say, wonderful. You know what kind of person she is? Da, 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 da. In other words, you're saying something good, but you know that it's going to trigger this uh, girl who's not her friend to say something bad. So that's called other Lashonar. It's like dust, meaning to say it's associated with Lashonar, but it's not outright Lashonar. So you can talk, so you can speak well of others if they're not around? If you know right, that. if you're speaking well of others and nice, and stuff, that's great. But when you know that you're talking nice about someone, it's going to trigger that someone else say something negative because they don't get along. Then mm -hmm. even saying something nice would be wrong. Mm -hmm. There's something very beautiful in Hasidus that explains why Lashon Hara is such a severe thing. Why is it so strong? So that's related to number two. Number two is it's Aramaic and it's from Gemara and it says Lashon Hara kills all three, which means it does damage to the one that's speaking, it does damage to the one that's listening, and it does damage to the person that's being discussed. And what's the damage? Damage? It could hurt them, bring on a certain punishment. I mean, yeah, I mean, I understand what it's mean, like, what is huh? written, like, what kind of damages? Like, and what the person, like, for someone who speaks, someone who listens, and how someone, like, really took off. The wording here literally means it kills. It could lead to killing three people, the one who speaks, the one who's listening, and the one who's being talked about. So it's not necessarily always such a severe punishment for just speaking Lashon Hara. But first of all, the rule is that listening to Lashon Hara is also inappropriate. In other words, someone said, I'm not talking, I'm just sitting there and listening. But basically, Torah says, if you wouldn't be listening, they wouldn't be talking. Mm -hmm. You ever heard the expression that the mouse is not the thief, the mouse hole is the thief? Because it wouldn't have where to go, he wouldn't uh, grab the cheese. What? Well, if like the listener is also at fault, like that inside, like the victim is also at fault, or is oh, the, I'm, the so I'm going to talk about the victim. Okay. So the one who speaks, that's obvious. The one who's listening, okay. But the one who's listening is also not so simple. Like, could you imagine a friend who wants to talk to you and you say, "I don't want to hear. Don't talk to me." You know, you might lose all your friends. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you can't talk to this girl. She's too holy. She only listens to... So you have to do it in a way that's not going to, you know, create that kind of thing. You try to avoid it. You try to go away. But the truth <clears throat> is, listening to Lashnara is inappropriate as well. Of course, it's different than the one that's speaking. That's the main person. But the one that's listening is a facilitator. You're facilitating and allowing them to speak the Lashon Hara. So you have to find a way that you're not going to hurt your reputation, you're not going to hurt your friendships, and yet avoid hearing stories about other people. Why the third person? He didn't do anything. He did something wrong, but now these two people are talking about me. Why should I suffer? So it says in Hasidus is like this, that Remember we said in the, uh, the page before, one of the things we spoke about that speech is very powerful, which means physically when you speak, nothing happens. If I say, I'm so upset, I'm going to break this table. Okay, it's only words, the table never broke. But spiritually, when a person speaks, it is causing things to happen in a spiritual sense. 
Um, I don't know if you remember this, but somewhere in Hayom Yom tells a story where the Bashemto was with his students and they heard in another room two people getting into an argument. And one person screamed at the other person and said, I'll tear you apart like a fish. Those were his words. So Hashemta told the students to put their arms on each other and make a human chain around the room. And the Hashemta himself put his hands on both of them and told them all to close their eyes. And after they closed their eyes, suddenly they all gasped like, ah! what was the huh? They saw this person tearing him apart like a fish. So what does that mean? So Hashemta said like this, just like in our world, there's speech, there's thought, there's action. In the spiritual realm, there's a world of thought, there's a world of speech, and there's a world of action. So when I speak, down here, we don't see anything happening. But up there, I'm causing this to happen in the world of speech. What the Baal showed them was how his neshama was ripping apart his neshama like a fish, but in the world of speech. So you might say, okay, it's in the world of speech. It doesn't affect me down here. But the answer is anything that happens in the spiritual realm is very likely that from there it'll evolve and something will happen down here. So therefore, when I speak about other person's negative traits, it's not only not nice because I'm talking about other people's negative traits, it's worse than that. By speaking about the negative traits, I'm reinforcing it and I'm making it stronger and I'm making it come out in a more open way. In other words, me speaking to another person about someone else's negative traits is reinforcing the negativity in that person. And the truth is also the positive. If I talk about someone's positive traits, about someone's potential, how good they are and how much potential they have in, in this area or in that area, by talking about it, the power of speech has the power to reinforce the good in the other person. And that's why Hasidus always tells us to focus on the positive, not on the negative and everything. And uh, it, 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 it's part of the reason why the person will be punished because what I'm doing is I'm bringing out the more open way the negative thing that they did. And therefore it could lead to them getting hurt. Yeah. What about like, in the case of like Jews who like they're not saying that the person that they're speaking about did anything bad but they're just like Saying something that could lead to someone. Right. So there, still, like, there the reason is just because it's going to lead to something. It could lead to something which is, you're not reinforcing the bad because you're not saying anything for bad. The person that's being spoken about. Right. Like, is that still like partially their, is it, like, is oh, their I'm not sure that in that case it will affect that person. Well, like, is it like their responsibility to like make sure that they're not? No, no. Imagine I have to run around all over the place. <laughs> don't talk about me. Don't talk about me. Everybody will be talking well, about you. Like, don't do anything that anyone could ever possibly think. <laughs> so this is similar to what we said yesterday, that the Rebbe teaches us to say, instead of saying bad, to say not good, instead of saying death, to say the opposite of life, instead of saying Yitzhahara, to say uh, the opposite of the Yitzhahara, and we mentioned the example of a hospital instead of saying, you know, that uh, the Rebbe also introduced this idea many years ago when a child is not well used the term a special child, not, not a term that a sick child. So number one, it's just speaking in a more positive way. Number two, it brings out the positiveness in the situation. The other way, you're reinforcing the negativeness. What does Niftar? Niftar means... It means passed away. Because people say it and it sounds like was niftar, like it's maybe more positive way to say it. It's, it's a, not as strong as a word as death. So niftar means he left us. Mm -hmm. What? No, I'm just, what? Rational, which is like, for example, just compute, like, it's so nice to say died, death, and it's not. Much more so yeah, what do they the, say in Russian? Uh, left. Left. It's, it's that's nice. lifter means like left. Yeah. It's nice word. It's, like, it's more. It's not not so coarse. Not yeah. so strong. Yeah. 
So nifter in Hebrew is like left. He went away. So it's like you. Like you said, English. He passed. Passed on. <clears throat> Any other examples anyone have about that? Any like to bring up? Yeah. Um, I heard one time the Rebbe said something about it. if you have an assignment, you shouldn't say like um, deadline. You say like due date. Mm -hmm. Right. Same or, thing, deadline. <laughs> Means if you don't get it done by then, you're dead. And due dates is a good word. <laughs> I also heard something, um, like instead of saying, I have to do something, like I have to finish davening, or I have to mm, clean the kitchen, or say, I get to I get to do this. Like, I, right. I get to do something. Also, when more. people say I have, there are difficulties in life, or you say there are challenges, I guess you notice even in an outside world in, in America, there's a certain movement to talk in a more positive language. If you think of it, I think it's in other countries as well. And uh, this is something which I definitely spoke about from the start. To when we speak, if we speak in a positive way, it reinforces positivity around us. So it said in the Mishnah to speak less and to do more. So obviously speak less means to be cautious, to be careful when I speak, because speech could lead, if the tongue is loose, you'll end up saying negative things. And the main thing is action. So first of all, we're gonna talk about what does it mean that the main thing is action? The few quotes and phrases there, that the most important thing is action. But people ask a question, why does it say speak less and do more, why can't you speak a lot and do a lot? So the answer is people who speak a lot about what they're going to do, don't end up doing it. They talk so much about their plans and what they're gonna do and how they're gonna do it, how amazing it's gonna be, that you feel a certain sense of satisfaction just from talking about it. Mm -hmm. And then you don't feel that need anymore to go ahead and do something about it. But that was very often, say in a humorous way how people realize there's a problem. So the first thing you do is make a meeting. And the first resolution of the meeting is that we, next week we have to make another meeting. And the next meeting we have to make a bigger meeting and meetings and meetings and meetings. A maisa hu ha'ik, which means action is the most important thing. So if a person uh, would train themselves to talk less about what they have to do and just focus on doing it, that's more important than all the talking and all the all the discussions. So I think one of the most powerful things related to this is number seven. This is also found in Hayom Yom. Toy Achas, one act is better than a thousand sighs. In other words, when something is not in order, somebody's in trouble, you sigh, oh, it's terrible, what's going on? You know, people sigh once, some people sigh 10 times, but he's saying a person would sigh a thousand times, it doesn't compare to just doing one act to help the situation. So we have to train ourselves to do action and not to focus on feelings and thoughts and, and discussions, but to make a change in actuality. So here are some of the quotes about action. Number one is something which the Rebbe probably said, I would say, more than a thousand times. Hamaisa hu ha'ikr. Action is the most important thing. Another quote similar to this is number two. I think this comes from the Zohar. Asiya le'ela. Action is above all. And number three is le'i ha'medrash ha'ikr ela ha'maisa. The main thing when it comes to Torah is not studying the Torah, but practicing what it says in the Torah and to do and act upon what it says. So if somebody, for example, is in a situation where they're in trouble and they need help, and I'll talk about how I feel bad for them, I'll cry for them, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sigh and cry and moan and groan, the Torah would say, don't cry and sigh and moan and groan. Just do something about it. 
if you can. If you can't, then you dive into Hashem and you cry out to Hashem. But if you can do something, focus on what can I do rather than how do I feel about it. Let me go to number six, and later I'll go back to four and five. The Gemara said there was once a big debate. So what's more important in Jewish way of life? Is it learning Torah or observing the mitzvahs? Because there's so much has been written about the greatness of Torah study. So much has been written about the greatness of action, doing mitzvahs. But which one would be greater of the two? So we know that Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish court of rabbis, when they would debate a halacha issue, at the end, they would vote on it. Because it says in the Chumash that the halacha is according to the majority of opinions. So there were 71 <coughs> sages. And by the way, every court has to have an odd number. Even the smallest court has to have at least three rabbis. Some have 23. Some have uh, 17. There has to be a number that's odd so that you can have a majority. So they voted on it. And they came to the conclusion, the majority of opinions was that Torah is greater. Why? But not because Torah in itself is greater, because Torah leads to action. In other words, action doesn't necessarily lead to learning Torah. But if you learn Torah properly, it'll lead to action. And that's why Torah, in a sense, has in it both qualities. Number one, it's Torah. And number two, it'll lead to, to become a more refined person. To appreciate this story about uh, uh, the discussion that the Rebbe had with the Chassid, I just want to preface it by saying that in Yiddish, the word for teaching and the word for learning is the same. Like in English, you say, I studied something, means I studied it. When you say, I learned something, I mean, I, 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 uh, I taught something, that means you're teaching others. But in Yiddish, the same word that's used for studying yourself, the same word that's used for teaching others, which I'll say in Yiddish, gilarent. Gilarent means I studied it, or it could mean I taught. So what happened was there was a chassid that came into the Alter Rebbe, and the chassid would always go to the Rebbe for guidance, spiritual guidance. He would tell the Rebbe about his schedule, about how much he daven, how much he learns, how much he gives tzedakah, uh, what's going on in his family, at work. And the Rebbe would guide him, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? So he told the Rebbe all the things that he studied. And he said, Yiddish, Chagilarant, I studied this, I studied this. I studied this Gemara, and I studied that Gemara. But again, in Yiddish, the word for study could also mean I taught. So when he finished listing all the Gemaras that he studied, the Alter Rebbe said them as a play on words. Okay, now I heard everything that you taught the Torah. What did the Torah teach you? In other words, when a person says in Yiddish, I learned Gemara Shabbos, it could also be translated as I taught the Gemara Shabbos. So what does that mean? What do you mean you're teaching the Torah? It basically means that a person is learning Torah, but they're not applying it to action. When I learn, I don't understand and don't get the message that what I'm learning has to change the way I live, the way I think, the way I feel, the way I interact with other people. And therefore, I end up putting my ideas into the Torah. It's like I'm teaching the Torah rather than the Torah is putting its ideas into me. So that's what it means. The main thing is not studying. The reason why we study, it's not just a pure academic exercise. We study Torah to become more refined people. So that our actions should be more refined. Our actions with our spouse, our actions with our children, interacting with people around us, and then you know that this person is a true Torah scholar. So the way the Torah defines the Torah scholar is not just academic, it's the way the person lives, the way the person acts. So this will explain number three or four, but we'll leave that for next week in Mitzvah Shem. Okay. All the best, everybody. Thank you. I love turkey hobbies.
What? Yeah, it's a very important part of the Torah. Really like, I want to ask everybody here for a favor. Hi, Rabbi. And that is, um, if there's a room in the dorm that you're having a problem with the heat, let me know which room it is and what the problem is. Is the problem that the radiator is not working? Is the problem that the, the window is allowing too much cold air to come in? Is the problem that someone opens the doors and all the cold air comes in? So, because we have to bring somebody down and what happens is we bring somebody down, he does something and then someone says, oh, I forgot to tell you. So let's get it all together. Let me know. And uh, we'll try to correct whatever it is before the winter really gets strong. I just have to buy a humidifier. I'm too southern for this dry heat. <laughs> I can't, there's no moisture in the air. What am I supposed to do? That's a different problem. Yeah. Brooklyn, New York. I'm going to 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 I'm going to